right? Uh, I'm actually feeling a bit dejected today because there's a BBC report that uh, lectures are not the most effective way of teaching because students, uh, after three days, have absorbed less than 10%. Okay, so, so prove, prove them wrong today. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to um, continue with uh, the uh, trip steals and uh, develop that uh, subject more. But I ended the last lecture uh, explaining that uh, silicon is very effective for stopping uh, cementite precipitation and therefore you can use the carbon that you've added to your steel to partition into the austenite and stabilize the austenite even if your average carbon concentration is small and you need that average carbon concentration to be low in order to ensure that you can for example spot weld the material and get other properties as well. So silicon is a problem though uh, because it forms a low melting temperature oxide during hot rolling deformation called faylite, the Fe2SiO4, uh, which keys into the material. So it, it makes the oxide very adherent. And after uh, the cleaning operation where you direct you know, high pressure jets at the steel to remove the oxide, there's still some left which then becomes Fe2O3 which has a red color. Now instead of silicon, to retard the precipitation of uh, cementite. Uh, we can use aluminum. Aluminum works by the same mechanism that its solubility in cementite is very low and therefore it retards the precipitation of cementite. Now I'm going to show you the um, iron carbon phase diagram. Uh, but a part of the phase diagram which you may not be very familiar with and that is this part of the phase diagram. So when liquid solidifies, it actually solidifies uh, as long as the carbon concentration is uh, less than this point B here. When it solidifies, it solidifies into ferrite. Okay? So at very high temperatures, we get ferrite, which is labeled as delta, but actually it's identical in crystal structure to alpha, exactly identical. But the reason why it's delta is because when you cool below about 1500 degrees centigrade, it begins to transform into austenite. And then once again, uh, below 900 degrees centigrade, you start to get ferrite again. Now, the reason for this is uh, magnetism. So magnetism stabilizes the alpha once again uh, when you get down to low temperatures. Uh, it's, it's a very large term in the free energy difference between the austenite and ferrite. Now, in the silicon rich uh, trip assisted steels, we had about 70% of allotomorphic ferrite, right? If we start to add aluminium to our steel to retard the precipitation of uh, cementite, the phase diagram also changes quite dramatically. So the addition of aluminium uh, beyond a certain concentration means that you never get any austenite at all. So beyond about, uh, I don't know, 4% of aluminium, 4-8% of aluminium, all the way from the liquid to room temperature, you will only have ferrite, okay? Uh, but there is, a, there is a region here where I can get a mixture of austenite and ferrite, and that's the level of aluminium that we would add because we definitely want austenite in our steel, okay? I can alter this phase diagram by adding other things as well. So for example, this is just the iron aluminium phase diagram. But if I add carbon, then that gamma loop, <laughs> we call this, uh, call this a gamma loop here, that can be extended to make the austenite more stable, or if you add manganese, etc. So we can play about with this phase diagram to get the right mixture, which is about 70% of ferrite, and the rest of it transforming roughly equally into uh, bainitic ferrite and retained austenite. Okay, so we're going to use a different concept now. Uh, instead of allotomorphic ferrite, we are going to retain some of the delta ferrite which forms directly from solidification. So the structure will look completely different, all right? Because, you know, what is the shape of a crystal which forms from liquid typically? Dendritic. Okay, so here, here you are. Uh, the 
image on the left is what you get immediately on cooling. The white region here uh, is the delta ferrite, which has formed directly from liquid. Can you also see some contrast inside the delta ferrite? What is that? Coring, exactly. So, so from part 1b, you remembered that, uh, you know, dendrites are not homogeneous and when you etch, you get a variation in contrast because there's differences in chemical composition from the center to the edge. And this used to be austenite, which has formed from the delta ferrite because originally it was almost completely delta ferrite and then austenite grows into it and at room temperature it's changed into mud inside. Okay, so this is the as cast microstructure. When we then heat treat it so that uh, we have a mixture of austenite and ferrite, um, we can never get rid of that delta ferrite by the way. Yeah, it formed from solidification and doesn't matter what temperature we go, we will always have the delta ferrite there. Right? But the remaining region uh, can be austenitic and then we transform it into a mixture of bainitic ferrite and austenite. Now, there is a big advantage of the fact that you can never make this material fully austenitic. So I explained to you that for spot welding, we require the steel to have a low carbon concentration. Otherwise, we get untempered mud inside, which will crack. Okay? Now, if you have permanently delta ferrite in the structure, you will never get 100% mud inside. So you can now actually play about with increased carbon concentration as well. So this steel actually has 0.4 weight percent of carbon, which would be unthinkable in a normal trip assisted steel, which has about 0.15 weight percent carbon. So in spite of this high carbon concentration, because it can never become fully martensitic, you can spot weld it. Okay. So we have a mixture. Instead of allotrimorphic ferrite, we have about 70% of delta ferrite. And then we have uh, about 15% of retained austenite and 15% of bainitic ferrite. The, the white regions in here uh, represent the bainitic ferrite. So it doesn't matter whether it's allotrimorphic ferrite or delta ferrite, we have still uh, got a similar structure. And it's quite remarkable, you know, this, uh, this was designed purely by calculation, all right? Uh, and uh, we did not expect this bizarre looking microstructure, but it happened. Uh, and look at the stress strain curve, you know, huge amount of elongation, all right? And if I look at the retained austenite content at the beginning, it's, uh, it's about that much, 15%. And at the end of the test, it has decomposed to 7%. In other words, it's tripping during the course of deformation and we have just the right amount of work hardening to continue to get uh, elongation okay, without uh, knacking until the very end. Now how can I prove that the austenite is critical here? Okay. Well uh, supposing I stabilize the austenite so that it doesn't transform then we should get a completely different stress strain curve, right? How can I stabilize this uh, without changing many other variables? Well, if I test it at 100 degrees centigrade, you know, boiling water temperature, uh, I'm not really changing the microstructure which has been generated at higher temperatures, but the austenite will be more thermodynamically stable, right? And we get a, this is on the same scale as the previous slide, and you can see that the elongation has dropped dramatically, and if you look at the amount of austenite at the beginning and at the end of the test, then you can see that it's not really contributing to the work hardening which leads to a greater elongation. So it's a very simple experiment that you just alter your tensile test temperature by 100 degrees centigrade to stabilize the austenite and you can prove that it's actually playing a role in controlling the work hardening capacity and therefore the point at which you get necking in your material. Is everyone happy with that? Okay, so we call this the delta trip steel, uh, just to distinguish it from normal trip assisted steels.
And if I go back to this slide, you can see that the combination of strength and elongation is very good. You know, the strength is of the order of 1,000 megapascals and the elongation of the order of 22%. Uh, um, <coughs> if I show you a comparison against all the steels that exist in this <coughs> particular sector, uh, automotive steels, I'm plotting here the elongation versus the ultimate tensile strength, which is the, uh, which is the sort of crude representation of formability. You know, you want strength, but you also want ductility. Uh, then these are the conventional alloys here, and this is the new delta trip steel, which has much higher combination of elongation and ultimate tensile strength. Notice here it's 40 percent. The slides that I was showing you were during the development stage, but then you have to scale it up and roll and so on, and even better properties are obtained when you do that. Now, there are a few points which are performing better, right? Can you see? Those are very special steels, which I'm going to talk about now. They're called TWIP steels, T-W-I-P twinning induced plasticity. So the shear strain during martensitic transformation is 0 0.26. What is it during twinning? Much larger actually. Let me, let me show you. So uh, twinning basically means that uh, you shear a crystal so that it reorients into a different orientation, but you haven't changed the crystal structure. Okay? So on the right, you can see that the structure here is a reflection of the structure here about the twin plane. But we haven't changed the crystal structure. It's simply uh, a deformation mode. Uh, there's obviously no volume change at all, because we haven't changed the crystal structure. And in FCC systems, Twinning happens on the closed back plane and in the direction 1, 1, bar 2 in that plane, which should remind you of Shockley partials. Yeah? So the dislocations which accomplish twinning are Shockley partial dislocations, A by 6, 1, 1, 2. So what does that mean in terms of stacking sequence? It will change the stacking sequence, right? Because it's not a lattice vector. Now, in the FCC to HCP transformation, we had a Shockley partial going on every second closed back plane. All right? In the case of twinning, it's on every single closed back plane to change the stacking sequence. So here, here is our uh, stacking sequence of closed back planes in cubic closed back. And we start with ABC, ABC stacking. And by putting a Shockley partial, we change uh, the stacking uh, position here from B to C, this from A to B. And then on the second layer, we go from C to A, and so on. And you can see that this side is a reflection of this side. Okay? So by passing a Shockley partial on every single closed back plane, you get um, uh, a change in stacking sequence, which is a reflection of the parent crystal, and that's twinning. Okay. So in the FCC A to HCP case, you have uh, a shear um, on every second plane, and here you have a shear on every plane. So how will the shear strain differ? Double. Double, right? So if you look at this slide, this was the Shockley partial here. And if we take the magnitude of that vector and divide by the spacing of the planes, we get 1 over root 2. In the case of FCC to HCP, it was half 1 over root 2, which is 1 over root 8. Okay? So the magnitude of the shear is much larger. And therefore, the elongation that we can get from twinning will also be larger. In the case of uh, a trip steel, which is fully austenitic, we worked out that the elongation is about 15%. Here, it would be of the order of 40 percent. Okay? So the potential for getting elongation from mechanical twinning is very high. Now, we also need to think about how does twinning add to work hardening capacity. Because in the case of the trip steel, 
you know, we form hard mud inside, right? So how does twinning give you work hardening? It's a totally different mechanism, okay? So if I, if I show you a micrograph of um, what this uh, steel looks like after deformation, you know, uh, on, on the left is uh, the surface and all the, uh, all the shears caused by twinning, and that's a transmission electron micrograph showing the twins in this particular kind of steel. So what do you think is the mechanism of work hardening? Yeah, so this is like a dynamic whole patch effect. In other words, you know, as soon as you form a twin, you are dividing the austenite into two smaller grains. And this process continues as you deform. And, you know, that is a transmission electron micrograph. And you can just about see that uh, the magnification here is one micrometer. So as a consequence of deformation, you've divided the austenite into incredibly small compartments. So that contributes to work hardening capacity, and therefore we should expect a lot of elongation. There's no phase transformation here, okay? Everyone happy with that? Okay, so look at the stress strain curve here. The elongation is enormous. It's, 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 you can even get 100% elongation, okay? In this case, it's about 70%. <coughs> and it starts off uh, quite weak because it's fully austenitic. So it's around 300 megapascals. And then it work hardens to more than 1,200 megapascals. Now, this particular form of a stress-strain stress curve can be a disadvantage because you are starting with a weak material. So, you know, when you form, you're not going to get uniform strain everywhere. So you're not producing a homogeneously strengthened component, right? But not to worry, everything has advantages and disadvantages. If we put in sufficient deformation, we can get uh, very high strength and also incredibly high elongation. Okay? Now, how do we make such a steel which is fully austenitic and deforms by twinning. In other words, when we deform the austenite, it doesn't undergo any phase transformation. S someone uh, in one of the lectures mentioned manganese, okay? And manganese is a very cheap alloying addition. Uh, so this, uh, this is just to show you that it's a dynamic whole patch effect. That means you're actually refining the grain size as you pull the material. So, Trip steels contain a large amount of manganese because manganese stabilizes the austenite. Uh, so you can see we've got 25 weight percent of manganese. And I'll explain to you why we have the silicon and aluminum later. Uh, and the addition of silicon and aluminum also reduces the density of the steel. So the normal density of a steel is about 7.8 grams per meter cubed. This is 7.3 grams per, uh, sorry, 7.8 grams per centimeter cubed. That would be nice if it was 7.8 grams per meter cubed, right? Uh, so this is um, a lower density. It's fully austenitic. And because it's fully austenitic, you don't have a ductile brittle transition temperature. Okay? So, you know, look at the toughness, uh, impact toughness as a function of temperature. It's more or less constant, even at, you know, minus uh, 196 degrees centigrade. So that's, that's remarkable, yeah? And uh, the cooling to a low temperature is equivalent to pulling at a very high strain rate, okay? So you can see that even at very high strain rates, uh, it, it has good properties. Now, uh, the reason for adding 25 uh, manganese is that if the manganese concentration is lower, then you induce various martensitic transformations during pulling, okay? So, you know, with 15 manganese, we've got both uh, the alpha prime martensite and the hexagonal martensite, epsilon. And at around 25 uh, weight percent manganese, we begin to get uh, just fully austenitic. When we deform it, all 
all we get is uh, twinning and dislocation movement, right? No phase transformation. And the reason for this is that the stacking fault energy varies quite a lot with uh, the manganese concentration. So, you know, when we talk about the FCC to HCB transformation, it's like putting in a stacking fault. A stacking fault is like a three layer region of HCP. And you can see that around 25 weight percent, the driving force for FCC to HCP becomes zero and positive after that. Okay? So, we don't get um, epsilon. Uh, we don't get uh, martensitic transformation once you've exceeded uh, that concentration of manganese. Is martensitic transformation desirable in this case? Uh, so, the level of elongation that we get when it's fully austenitic because of the twinning subdividing is much greater than with the martensitic transformation. So, you know, we were talking about 25 percent roughly in trip steels. Yeah. But this is, you know, ridiculous amounts of elongation. 100 percent is possible. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Now, uh, when these uh, steels were first invented, uh, a major problem was discovered, okay? Because we want to form things. When you formed the material, so that's a 22 uh, manganese and 0 0.6 carbon alloy and the stand uh, one of the tests for formability is that you make a cup out of it okay and it shouldn't show any cracks and sure enough it doesn't show any cracks but you leave it there for a while and it breaks up all right and the reason for that is when you form something you are building in a set of stresses right they are called residual stresses. So, even if the body is not moving, it actually has stresses inside it. They are called residual stresses. Yeah? Uh, and then you have got the environment. And the environment introduces hydrogen into the material and it, then it breaks. So, this is called static fracture. And it is a problem not just in this context, but when we make extremely high strength bolts for bridges and so on. you know they break in an erratic manner unless you do something to control the hydrogen. Uh, and I mentioned the mechanism by which we do that. We introduce tiny vanadium uh, carbide particles which trap the hydrogen right, in the context of bolts. Uh, so, this, this, w this is disastrous. All right? if, if a car manufacturer sees something like that, they are not interested in this material. So, uh, how was this solved? Well, uh, Basically, empirically, it's found that when you add aluminium, it solves the problem. Okay, so we have about three weight percent of aluminium, and then uh, you do some work to understand why the aluminium does this. All right. So uh, these are first principles calculations showing the FCC cell, and what we are doing is we are substituting uh, uh, one of the atoms of iron with aluminium. What that does is that it actually increases the interatomic spacing locally here. Okay? You can see that distance is greater than that distance. It's causing effectively a, a volume expansion locally, which then traps the hydrogen. Right? So hydrogen likes to be in a region where there's a bit of strain. Okay? So that's the mechanism by which uh, uh, the uh, aluminium works. So, in conclusion, you know, that particular problem is solved. Uh, trip and trip steels, basically, either you have a phase transformation or twinning under the influence of an external stress, and both of those, by different mechanisms, enhance the work hardening rate. And therefore, we get both strength and ductility. Okay? Now, there are some uh, remaining problems. Uh, you could, you know, as you said, you could have a combination of martensitic transformation and twinning by adjusting the uh, composition, and therefore you could use transformation induced plasticity to mitigate the residual stress. And I'm going to talk about that uh, next. Is Instead of inducing transformation by applying a stress, if a material naturally develops a stress for some reason, 
then trip could relieve that stress. Yeah? So do you know any circumstances where residual stress is really important in fabrication? So you've heard of the Welling Institute, which is not far from here, right? Um, I mean, that whole institute focuses just on welding because unless you can weld something, it's really of very little use okay, in, in structural applications. That's actually the oldest spin-off from this university. And it's been going uh, for something like 70 years, completely self-funded. Yeah? OK, so imagine that we have these uh, two large pieces of steel which have to be joined. And there's a gap initially. Okay, And we fill that gap with liquid. So these are the two large pieces of steel. And in between, we have liquid, so there's no stress because a fluid can flow, right? Then it becomes solid, so you get continuity here. And as the uh, solidified liquid contracts, it pulls against its surroundings. And, you know, normally these components are large, so they're going to resist that pull. And therefore, you end up with a level of stress which is not far off the yield strength of the material. So even before you've applied any external loads, you've got a built-in system of stresses. And you know, that limits, what you can, limits the amount of load that you can apply in service. right? So this is a, a major problem. So we need to do something to compensate for this stage of the process that we need to cancel out the effect of thermal contraction. And you know, the structures that we are talking about are huge. So this is a, an oil rig in the North Sea. And you know, the height below the surface is three times the height above the surface. So this is massive construction. And it's welded all over the place. So we have to uh, think about the effect of residual stresses. The, these are pipelines, oil, oil and gas pipelines, which traverse you know, thousands, of, thousands of kilometers through harsh conditions. So this is uh, in the um, uh, Alaska. Okay? The ground is permanently frozen, and uh, temperatures can get to minus 30 degrees centigrade. And yet, they have to tolerate stresses, hydrogen, all sorts of things. And of course, they are welded. Yeah? They are welded in two directions. One is along the seam to make the pipe. And then uh, the different pipes are joined together. Okay? So huge technology, actually, because if, if you get fracture, then the fracture can propagate for kilometers. Okay? Uh, because um, the plastic zone is effectively several meters long. So th these are absolutely spectacular tests. You know, you take a long pipe, you seal it from both ends, and then you overpressurize to see whether this crack will actually stop in, in a certain distance. Okay? So you effectively blow up these pipes. It's fantastic to see. OK, so uh, there was, in 1977, a brilliant set of experiments done by Albury and Jones. So here we have a, a specimen, which is austenite. And at around 1300 degrees centigrade, we constrain it. Okay? And then we simply allow it to cool, maintaining that constraint. So obviously, thermal contraction takes place, and you get an increase in stress. Yeah? Now, supposing that I change the alloy so that it can transform to bainite. Uh, then you can see that when the transformation happens, you cancel out the stress because you know, you've know you got uh, both the shear strains and the volume change, which compensate for the thermal contraction. But once the transformation is exhausted, the stress rises rapidly. Okay? So that's no good. Uh, if I now lower the transformation temperature by forming martensite, then the situation is better. I get, end up with less residual stress. But ideally, I want this point to be somewhere there. Okay? 
So I want to make my weld martensitic, which, you know, would raise alarm bells immediately because you're not going to be allowed to do heat treatment on an oil rig. Yeah? So you want it to be martensitic and you want it to transform at a temperature which is not too far away from room temperature. So how can I produce a nice martensite which will be nice in its untempered state? Very little, very little carbon. Okay. So very low carbon and therefore we are going to have to use expensive alloying elements. Yeah? But you know the expense of alloying elements in a weld is actually quite small because you are using small quantities of material to fill in the gaps. And if you solve the problem of residual stress and so on, then that's a huge gain. Okay? Right, so um, I have emphasized throughout this course that you are never working on a single property when you are designing something. You have to satisfy all the other requirements for a welding alloy, not simply just a low transformation temperature. And uh, all of these properties you have to make sure are not compromised when you make a new welding material. Now one of the things that uh, took us almost 12 years to solve, all right, is that nickel is supposed to improve the toughness of steels, all right? Uh, but what we found is that is not the case, all right? Uh, typically a weld metal will contain manganese as well because um, manganese captures oxygen and therefore you end up with less oxygen inside the weld metal. We, we are not going through complex steel making processes here. We simply deposit the metal from solid, okay? So it's, there's going to be more oxygen in the well metal than in the steel itself. Typically 300 parts per million in the form of oxides. You don't want too much of that because the oxides can cause fracture. So according to this, you know, if I, if I increase the nickel concentration, I'm actually getting a decrease in toughness. So we are plotting the Sharpe impact energy, right? So that goes against intuition. Uh, however, the same model indicates that at low manganese, I will actually get an increase in toughness. All right? So we made these three alloys just to verify this because you know the normal philosophy is that nickel improves toughness, whatever. Okay? Whereas this was indicating otherwise. So we made these three materials. These two, A and B, should show lower toughness and C should show a high toughness. And sure enough, that was the case. And we understand the mechanism of this, uh, that we start to get um, a coarse phase, which involves the coalescence of many plates, if we have a high manganese concentration and a high nickel concentration. So the reason why I'm telling you this story is that designing a new material is not as simple as writing a paper. Okay? You have to satisfy so many parameters that uh, it is really interesting. <coughs> so here, for example, is, uh, is an alloy uh, with that much chromium, that much nickel, manganese low, and very little carbon, right? Because we are going to form martensite, but we want the martensite to have good properties. And Albury and Jones' experiment was very simple. They took a tensile specimen, constrained it, and allowed it to cool. We are now using uh, equipment worth a billion pounds to do the same thing, uh, which is a, a thermomechanical simulator here connected to a synchrotron in Grenoble. So the reason for doing this is we can observe phases as they transform because these are very high energy X-ray beams and therefore you can penetrate your whole tensile specimen and get really, really good information on phase transformation behavior, stresses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the essential result is the same as Albury and Jones. Uh, okay, this this uh, is direct measurement of the transformation behavior. Okay, because X-rays give you the phase fractions, right? And these are the sort of curves that Albury and Jones did. And you can see that for an ordinary well metal which transforms at a high temperature, you end up with whoops, 
you end up with quite a lot of residual stress whereas with the low temperature transforming material you end up with either a compressive stress or a, a zero tensile stress okay so this is a uh, effectively this is a smart welding material which compensates for thermal contraction okay now of course uh, these are uh, still quite simple tests and what you need to do is to prove it for a weld metal and uh, you make a weld and then you measure the residual stress in there now what sort of diffraction technique could I use to do that because you know these are not small objects right x-rays can penetrate uh, you know a few millimeters but I want to look at the stress distribution in something that's uh, centimeters big neutron. neutron diffraction okay so these tests are done at Chalk River in Canada and we have here the high temperature transforming material at the top and you can see the longitudinal residual stress uh, contours and if you look at the low temperature transforming uh, you might see that there's a minus sign here okay so that's a compressive stress so it works when you actually make the weld itself right and then um, the the project was actually initiated by the Navy because they needed to weld submarines and because the steel is a high strength steel you know you can't heat treat it afterwards so you can locally heat treat a well by putting an electrical blanket around it but that would compromise the properties right so once you deposit the weld, you don't want any further heat treatment and the second issue is um, distortion so when the components are able to move right then the residual stress is relaxed but you get distortion as a consequence right and you can't tolerate that on on a big object yeah. now we were then asked to make the same concept but for a stainless steel now stainless steel doesn't have to be austenitic yeah, it can be martensitic it's only stainless because it has a high chromium concentration right so you can make uh, uh, you can follow the same philosophy that this time we want a high chromium concentration because that produces this coherent oxide film on the surface which protects the steel uh, carbon concentration has to be close to zero low MS temperature for for the same reason that we don't want the transformation to be exhausted before we reach room temperature and uh, at some temperature it should be fully austenitic otherwise we don't get it fully martensitic uh, there's another reason why we want solidification to begin with delta ferrite uh, to do with impurity concentrations all right we want the martensite to compensate for the thermal contraction yeah. so we need quite a lot that that's the only reason yeah okay um, so here is a, a design of an alloy two different alloys they are transforming at a low temperature and you can see that compared with a fully austenitic well metal okay the low temperature transforming alloy reduces the distortion by a huge amount okay so it's the same concepts uh, as the um, you know the non stainless steel welding alloy that I was talking about but it transforms at a low temperature and therefore it reduces uh, the distortion that you get okay everyone happy with that okay so um, that finishes actually all all of the concepts that we needed to cover and the last lecture will be on uh, bulk nanostructured steel okay yeah that's uh, I think it, it's on uh, is it tomorrow no I think it's on Friday yeah okay good so I'll ask you some questions and see uh, whether you remember the lecture okay <laughs>